Welcome to Nailing the Apex, everyone. I'm Tim Haraney. Please head on over to Spotify. Give us a five-star rating and a follow. Same goes with Apple Podcasts as well. Write a review as it really helps us grow the show. You can also watch us on YouTube, and you can follow me on social media at Tim Haraney. Today in the show, we welcome David Salters on, who is the president of Honda Performance uh, Development, or HPD for short. David, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I'll give everyone a quick quick, quick background on yourself. So you oversee uh, Honda's US racing and engineering activities, and you work directly with uh, Honda's racing teams and sponsors. Um, how did you get into this? <laughs> well, he hello, Tim. Hello, everyone listening. And thank you very much for the invite. It's lovely. Thank you. Um, oh, so uh, 28 years ago, yeah, a long time ago. When you start to measure things in divisions of centuries, it's a bit depressing, isn't it? But there you go. But, um, and uh, the bottom line is I couldn't find a proper job, and I apparently still haven't, So, uh, according to my lovely wife. So one day she is expecting me to do a proper job. No, so the um, I actually started doing research. So I did a PhD and all that sort of stuff, and I quite like research. Um, I was doing... Um, Engine research, optically accessed engines. In fact, it was Ford's. We had a, I worked at University College London and we, we had a research project with Ford in Dearborn looking at the first generation of DI engines. Of course, they're all pretty much DI these days. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was pretty good and I loved it, but it was a bit slow. Um, cause it was, you know, the pace was a bit slow and stuff. And after a little while, I realized, cause I thought I might do academic stuff because I quite like research and learning stuff and that sort of stuff. And, um, the um it was a bit slow so i thought eh, racing feels like it's much faster and i've always loved i was really into f1 and all that sort of stuff actually my real passion was group b rally cars so i used to go and stand in forests and watch them thunder through spit and fire and go and fell too fast so i was always into racing and i thought well maybe it's time for a bit of a change so i sort of changed and stopped doing researchy stuff and got a job at Cosworth doing mm. um, racing, uh, design, uh, design development, helping design bits of crankshaft, pistons, all that sort of stuff on what was the Ford Kart engine um, then. So that's, that's how we ended up there. So you've been at uh, HPD now for about eight years, but before like all of that, I want to say 1999 to, to 2006, you know, you were with Mercedes and then also Ilmore as well at the same time. And I mean, at one point you were what the head of F1 engine development for, for Mercedes at, at one point. Yeah. The, the, um, so yeah, so I did, did my, um, spell, uh, started to learn my craft and trade in Cosworth and then about five years and then moved to what was Ilmore, which became Mercedes, started doing cart there and then got asked to get involved with V10 uh, uh, performance development, actually, which was pretty awesome because th those engines were amazing. So, yeah, and then did performance development and then ran the engine development group. So you have sort of design group, development group, um, and I ran the engine development group at Mercedes, which was V10s, and then it switched to the V8. Yeah, so I did, uh, that was my sort of entry into F1 around 2001. Yeah, 2001, 2000. The V10s, I think for like myself, I, I love that generation of, of F1 engine. Uh, it, to, to me, it, it's the one that sounded the best. Uh, I mean, I used to race in, Renault, so the driver development program, and also uh, Formula Atlantics as well. But when we were with Renault, we would travel around with with Formula One as as the undercard. And I always remember, if you could get close enough to the track, you could feel the V tens literally shaking. You know, a bit of the ground you were standing on, depending on how close you could actually get to the to the track. I mean, is where would you put the, the V10s, like all the engines you've worked on? Like, because you've worked on many, but where would you put those V10s? Uh, the, you've got to love all your children equally, but the, <laughs> the, have, uh, the, the V10 was astonishing. That was probably the most visceral. Ooh, hold on a second. Uh, that was probably the most uh, visceral um, experience. I mean, the, they used to just howl. 
uh, the noise and um, go through the gears. And of course, we used to run among the dinos all the time, but you never quite, you get used to these things, but you never, it was always special to be doing mm. testing, uh, even though you did it every day and during the night and the weekends and all the things you do when you're doing Formula One. But the V10 was particularly special and the spectacle of the cars. When you see them now, they are magical and mythical, aren't they? We. Yeah. We had qualifying engines in those days as well. So you had uh, engines for practice, engine for race, the life. There was no real restriction on the life. So everything was done just to get power. And uh, the qualifying engines went in and they did. They did 100 kilometers, 60 miles. And then the engine was done. <laughs> but we used to rev. If I, my, the maximum revs I remember was uh, 19,750 RPM. So this thing used to howl. It was a three litre V10. And um, we, made, we made sort of slightly north of 950 horsepower towards the oh end. Oh, my God. They were, they were not far off a 1,000 horsepower. Out of a normal three litre, you know, what's in your minivan? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and the but they and we had all sorts of exotic materials, um, aluminium, beryllium, pistons, and valves that were you could almost bend them with your hands. They were wow. they were beautiful, not not quite, but they and titanium aluminides and it was it was quite. You did lots of experiments then, a bit less simulation. Simulation mm -hmm. was still getting. Uh, developing and computers were still developing. We did a lot of experiments, a lot of really intuitive engineering and hand calculations and that sort of stuff and really good sound basic engineering. You have to understand really intuitively and from your textbooks what was going on. So, but th those things were, we did things incredibly quickly, um, really. The amount, the cycle time, because you just made it, tested it, made it, tested it. That was the game. Mm. And actually, Ilmore Mercedes was particularly good at that. We had amazing machine shops, thanks to Paul Morgan and stuff. So every race we bought something new, like new, new. And so, yeah. Sometimes you'd just be putting in and testing it at the track and hoping it was all right. <laughs> For the... For the uh, for the amount of engines, like you would run within the weekend, so you'd have a practice engine, qualifying engine, a race engine. So, I guess how many, you know, round number? How many would you use in a season back then during the that V10 era? Hundreds. Um, the wow. Um, it could be the you could have practice. I mean, Friday, you could have one or two engines that were changed, depending what you were doing or testing, because also you'd use that as a way to... The transient dynos, which are now... You do a huge amount of testing on transient dynos these days, really because track testing sort of banned-ish. But then track testing was everything, and you didn't do much on the dy on the transient dyno. But you go track testing, and I don't know, you might do 20, 30 days of track testing a year. So that was engines and of course everything every time you went there was something new but then you'd arrive on friday and there could be something for friday morning maybe something different for friday afternoon then get ready for the race could even uh, get ready for quali um so you'd have a maybe the engine to carry over for practice on saturday or not and then quali engine and then race engine so you could be you could be using four or five engines during a weekend the guy used to run the race team would often ring up because we'd lose track of what was what. Because <laughs> so, cool. they all had <clears throat> all had special calibrations and all that. I mean, we we're super well organized, but you know, just to check. Um, every different spec had its own calibration and what's in it and all that sort of stuff. And you'd like, well, oh, let me check. <laughs> so <laughs> it was it was awesome. It's but it's super agile. It was it yeah. was all done, people speaking to each other, just great communication, smallish team, but super motivated. It was, it was quite special. And from, those engi engines were awesome. So from, from there, so we would say from 2006 to 2015, you got to work with, for Ferrari, the Formula One team as their head of engine development. Uh, you were constructors champions in 2007, 2008, if memory, memory serves right. 
um, you got to work with with Michael Schumacher. Like, what was what so was he both, like? I, <laughs> I, I, it was halfway through his last season, so I got to go to briefings and stuff. He was there. You sort of figured out why he was Michael Schumacher. I think incredibly well prepared, organized. Um, would arrive in debriefs with just pages of notes and always came to the briefings. I would fly in. We have briefings Monday afternoon. From my experience, I had a very limited experience with him, but it became, you know, the detail and preparedness and the dedication. It mm. was it was pretty obvious why he was Michael Schumacher. <laughs> so, what about, um, uh, yeah, I bet. Yeah. What about uh, Kimi Raikkonen? Because you got to work with him too. So what was... uh... (laughs) Kimi was awesome. Obviously different. Um, But Kimi really... um, Obviously Kimi was super fast. Like really fast. Yeah. So you had to... You know, you admired that. But he understood very much uh, what he was doing. Obviously uh, Kimi sort of grew up karting and worked on his own karts and all that sort of stuff. And, you know pulled himself up and um, and I had a good understanding. I had a nice, but didn't say a huge amount, but when he said something, it was important. Everyone listened. But, um, you know, again, I was lucky enough to 2007, he was world champion. That was the first time, um, yeah, he was, I joined in 2006 and then uh, 2007, he became the world champion of me. So the, um, he, you don't, you're not a world champion by accident. <laughs> so, um, but, he, yeah, for sure. you know, it's Kimmy's Kimmy. Um, but he's very straightforward, very to the point. Um, in engineering debriefs, what was important will be important. It's like when we, I was there, he, he was there when we did the V6, so the current turbo um, um, sort of hybrid, which are incredibly complicated. But he has to come in and sit with us for an afternoon so he could understand it all. So uh, mm-hmm. myself and um, good friend Enrico, I think, and Luca Marini at that point, we sort of went through stuff with him. And uh, I sat there and went through how it all worked and what it did and how the energy different, how the MGU-H worked and K and how the energy moved around and the sort of energy flow rules and all that sort of stuff. And then... At the end of the day, sort of, you know, he he was coming back to check his knowledge, and within an afternoon, got it all. So, so you know, smart, understood it all. Just thought, yep, yeah, got it right. Yep, yeah, if I do this, this, that, and you're like, okay, cool. See you, Kimmy. <laughs> so, so, so it, was, it was in. So, I can say you're not you're not a champion. At that level, you are the best of the best. Just to get there, you're the best of the best, aren't you? Everyone in Formula One is a champion in their own right, typically, to get there. And then to be champion of champions is... So you you need to be fast and you need the mental capacity and the calmness. Of course, Kimi was super calm. So then you can think about things and stuff. But the... No, he, he, he's, a, he's a hero, isn't he? So... You were also there during the, uh, I guess the the Felipe Massa almost winning the championship. Didn't win the championship in in two thousand and eight when it yeah. went to uh, Lewis Hamilton. But that last that last lap, those last few corners, when you know the team finds out that you know Felipe is a champion, and then Timo Glock has his issue. Lewis goes around and comes in to collect the championship. What I mean, that thirty seconds. What was that? I mean, like for, for you and for the team, like how how emotional Heart- was that? Heartbreaking. So from pure elation to pure devastation in one corner. So, um, yeah, I've never met Timo Glock, but, yeah. He, he, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, <laughs> He's a good no, guy. No, you He's can't. He's a good guy. Yeah, I'm sure he is, but, yeah, if he just held Lewis up a bit longer, it would have been great. <laughs> so I will not let him pass. But the, the, um, no, that's, um, I mean, that is, you can't make this stuff up. In pure drama, it was yeah. amazing. But obviously being on the receiving end of it, I guess the year before with Kimmy, it was sort of, we really, you know, well done to Ferrari for just keeping cool and stuff. And I guess um, Alonso was, Ham- Hamilton were fighting. And then it looked like they had it sewn up and then we nipped in at the end and got it. 
And then sort of it happened the other way around the year after. So, but I remember leaping. I was watching the television, um, you know, it's a Sunday or whatever. And, uh, and the leaping round, you know, we've won, we've won. And then look back at the television and notice that there was a problem. And uh, it was, yeah, you can't. It took a while to get over that, to be honest with you. But it, it also taught yeah, me... I bet. Till you cross the line, until everybody crosses the line, it's not done, isn't it? So, yeah, it, uh, it was, it was yeah. devastating, but there you go. It's, that's racing, and it's that's, yeah, that's the pure emotion of it and the sport of it. You've also got to work with some uh, really interesting team principals. Um, you had mentioned before we, we started recording, you know, getting interviewed by, uh, by Ross Braun when you're actually sitting in front of you know, a gentleman like Ross Braun and you're getting interviewed by him. What is, what does that feel like? Does that actually like sink in your head? Like, Hey, I think I made it. <laughs> well, uh, that, that's a funny story. The, um, it was good. They actually got interviewed in his kitchen. So he'd come over to the UK and he had a house. So I went to his kitchen and his dog liked me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that helped a lot. I, I like dogs. Um, I got two here that may chirp in occasionally. So I got interviewed in his kitchen and Jean made us some supper and uh, went through interview and uh, his dog took a liking to me. So I think that helped a lot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he had a lovely little dog that I sort of, yeah. So, so I got interviewed in Ross Bourne's kitchen and then got sort of went out to, seemed to get through that and then went out to uh, Marinello uh, one quiet weekend and uh, had interview with Paolo Martinelli, Gilles Simon and Steph. And then after I arrived, sort of got um, summoned into Jean Todd's office so that he could check I was uh, okay. And uh, he gave me some good advice on uh, what was required and uh, pretty straightforward, which is good. And uh, off we went nine years later. Well, I got to ask, what was the advice? <laughs> um, there was bits of advice, like... Um, you know, just do. John Todd was a really good. Um, he he managed the business, but you know, he wanted people to do their jobs. He kept the pressure away in some points, but you know, it was clear. You're in Formula One. You're in Ferrari. I mean, it, it's it was a dream, but it's it's hard work. I mean, it's really hard work. So he just said, you know, mm -hmm. uh, focus on the work. Um, the engine group worked in Italian, so I had to learn Italian. So, um, yeah, so I was 40 odd years of age. So, um, it gets harder for stuff to sink mm -hmm. in as you get older. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I sort of took myself off before I got there. I started learning Italian and then I had a, every lunchtime for about a year, uh, I had a great language tutor. So my lunch was spent doing private Italian lessons, but John, John said, concentrate on the work. Don't worry about the Italian, um, uh, but, you know, you need to You sort of, he said, just make sure the work is good and you find the performance and stuff. Don't get too upset about the Italian stuff because, you know, he realized it's not straightforward. Um, so that that was his advice. Make, you know, and enjoy it and just any problems, let him know. And um, so it was, it was really nice. See, obviously, he was the president. I had my immediate bosses, but it was very, you could tell how good he was. He wanted to know who was coming into the company, what they were doing and sort of encourage you. And he would wander in the evenings. You'd be minding your own business eight or nine o'clock at night, getting some testing done. We used to work late and he'd just wander into the dino and uh, come and have a look what was going on sometimes. Uh, how's it going? What are you up to? Hmm. It was quite, you know, on his sort of, he'd wander around, come and have a quick chat. So yeah, it, it was lovely. I mean, he, he, he was on it, you know, we, very straight. This is the goals. This is what we got to do. Exactly what you should have. But uh, no, it was it was quite special actually. I once had him and um, Bernie Eccleston in my test cell there. So when the new V6 came, they were all a bit worried about the noise. So we had Jean Todd with Bernie Eccleston come in and um, Luca Montezemolo come and listen to the engine to see. Of course, in a real test cell, all you hear is a lot of mechanical noise. So he got them all, we had to open the door and they were all shouting at each other because of course it was really noisy. 
<laughs> trying to figure out if it was good noise or not good noise. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was very, I wish I'd, we should take the picture. It was comical. Three, three, you know, the most famous people ever in the history of motorsport shouting at each other next to the test cell door. Like, you know, you're thinking these guys are nuts. <laughs> you got, like I'm, I'm sure you, like you're you must be referring to like when the v8 switched over to the the, the v6 yeah the yeah. the v6 hybrids and like i remember covering you know that part of f1 at the beginning of the season and there was so much backlash from the fans because you couldn't really hear the engines and think things like that like what is that the sort of the conversation yeah. that they were having at that at that moment because it was, it i mean wasn't. not to yeah, not not to bash the, the the hybrids or anything, but uh, in that 2014 season, they did start off fairly quiet, and it was yeah, a big was, it was yeah. a big leaving from the V8s, right? Yeah, because they were all fairly screamy. But I think we missed a trick because again, Formula One is often well ahead of the curve. Yeah, yeah they were quieter, mm -hmm. but they're like the most efficient powertrains ever made. And we forgot mm -hmm. to tell anybody and the technology and hybrid, yes. of course, is extremely relevant now, uh, climate change, all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. And we, we were miles ahead, but we didn't really, we didn't really say what was inside because yet yeah, the noise went down because we we're actually taking all that energy and using it usefully. So, you know, the NGUH on the turbocharger. So the motor with the turbocharger was basically sucking all the energy out of the exhaust and using it for performance. So that hence the noise, all the energy was being taken away by the exhaust from the turbine. And, um, we didn't really explain that. Unfortunately, that was probably a mistake. And mm -hmm. you know, you're at 50% thermal efficiency and super clever hybrid systems and uh, all that sort of stuff. And you know, motors. 120 kilowatt motors, so what's that, 150 or 60 horsepower, that literally are seven or eight kilograms. You could pick a motor up that is 140 horsepower and put it in your pocket if you had a big pocket. <laughs> so we, we didn't tell anyone, unfortunately, which wasn't so smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i was um i got a i got a walk through so during the i went to the british grand prix and i got a i got a walk through from the mercedes team they brought in last year's uh engine to sort of let us take take a look at this thing and, and where the you know the driver kind of sits on the battery and obviously the engine placement and then obviously you've got both of the recharging factors that are involved with all of it how complex um were these engines to, to, to build and put together and to conceptualize? Super. It, it was the biggest challenge I've ever faced. Um, we had different issues at Ferrari. So obviously we were busy fighting for a championship with the V8, with Fernando mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. So of course you don't, you don't want to give up on fighting for what you could have now and putting some more stuff in the history books. Um, but then you should have really started on the new stuff. And it was pretty hard. And when you've got to do two, when you've got to do all the current stuff and keep up the rate of development and all the new stuff, of course, your workload at least doubles, but then the new stuff is the most complex stuff we've ever seen in a race car ever. So it wasn't like the workload doubled. It went up three or four times. So that was a... Just that challenge of trying to be competitive with the current V8 and fight for championships because you didn't want to let the pace up there, but then somehow take up the biggest challenge with electrification and the engine was completely different, fuel flow, um, super lean, thermal efficiency. So it was, uh, it was a brilliant time. I mean, I, when all that started, I went to work and didn't come home for two and a half years. So I don't think my wife saw me for two huh. years. <laughs> so, so I would I would leave home about seven o'clock in the morning and then come home at two midnight, two o'clock in the morning. And my wife realized wow. that the pillow the pillow was indented and someone had been there. Uh, hopefully me. And the, the <laughs> so, and uh, but I I just disappeared for two or three years to be honest with you. And then 
general hello about two years later. So, no, but the um, joking aside, the but it was addictive. I mean, you know, you're all in it together. It's what yeah. Formula One is. It's pure development, and it's a race. It's a development race. Can you do it quicker than your opponent? But it was really what was really complex. So we had to invent. It was a new type of engine, ran very lean, limited by fuel flow, and all sorts of different combustion technology. But we just got single cylinders going and stuff. We're slightly behind, but we got it going. That was something I was very keen to get done. Very proud of that. Um, which is a brilliant tool for combustion development. And then, of course, we had the electrification, uh, which was all... We'd done bits of it with the CARES system on the V8. So we had some good knowledge. So... The actual hardware, we knew a bit about motors and batteries and that sort of stuff. But again, everything has to be lighter than it should be, smaller than it should be, more powerful than it should be, not quite know how to dissipate its heat because it, it needs to be, it can't be over-designed. It's got to be at the raggedy edge. Mm -hmm. So you have to take that next step. But then the real challenge of those powertrains was making everything work together. So you got a control system mm -hmm. for the engine. You got a control system for the MGU H on the turbocharge. You got a control system for the K. Um, you got all the gear shifting. You got um, uh, inverters that um, you know, and you got to move energy around. And how do you do that? And then ideally, you're trying to save fuel and these super lean. So you got all these control systems fighting each other, and that was a real problem at the start just trying to get all the control systems to work together so that the driver could actually use the car properly. So um, that was one of the real eye-opening challenges. You know, there were six or seven super complex control systems on those cars, and that took a lot of... And then you had to make it work with the test cell, with the dyno, which is another control system. It was almost easier to use yeah. the car sometimes, but of course you couldn't go testing. So um, yeah, that was that. That was uh, wow. Busy. <laughs> so. that's, yeah, I bet that, that's incredible. Uh, well, now switching gears and talking a bit about IndyCar. Obviously, they're going to be deploying their hybrid engine in 2024. So I, you know, I guess my first question for you is, you know, why make this shift from you know the V6 turbos that they run now over to the hybridization? Okay, so um, <clears throat> so the, I guess the world is going that way. We all want to be responsible. Um, those technologies are out there. So the what happened is um, on the current sort of, um, let's say, contractual era of IndyCar, it was proposed there would be a spec hybrid system. So for Honda, um, I, I think IndyCar proposed that because generally that was interesting to lots of manufacturers, electrification, hybrid. So mm -hmm. it was proposed there would be a hybrid system. So for Honda, that's particularly interesting. We have a lot of good hybrid cars. 50% of the sales of our CRV are hybrid, Accord are hybrid. It's a good, it's a good step to full BEV, really. Um, and, um, so that was interesting to us, the fact that IndyCar was offering that. Um, we do the same thing. That's why LMDH was interesting for us for Acura. We obviously also mm -hmm. uh, engineer um, help with Orica, who did a brilliant job put together the ARX06. We look after the powertrain. So, you know, electrification is important and trying to develop those technologies and learn about them in racing is important. So energy management and all these sorts of things. Um, obviously, both those series, uh, IndyCar's done a fantastic job, low-carbon fuel, uh, which is really novel. Uh, the nice thing is to see we're leading, not following. Um, racing is an IndyCar. We're using low-carbon fuels. That's sort of before those things are in road cars, really. So it's what racing should be for. Um, we should there new technologies. Okay, hybrid is is not new, but trying to think of, again, when you go racing, you make it too small, Places it shouldn't go, try and make it too powerful. And eventually that stuff trickles down, really. So, um, and then we do, particularly in LMDH, it's different. We do a lot of work on energy management and all that sort of stuff, software. Um, so 
basically with IndyCar proposing a spec system that was interesting to us. So, yeah, that's cool. Was it originally supposed to be like the using the 2.4 liter uh, unit instead, but because now they're switching to the the 2.2 liter, right? Yeah, so we're keeping the. Um, so originally it was 2.4. Um, 2.4, I guess. Right. Yeah, we were, well, it was meant to make the move to 2.4 and hybrid, but because of COVID mm. got in the way of supply chain, all that sort of stuff. So. The hybrid sort of moved, and then um, I guess um, some choices on what might be sort of important looking for the future. And also, uh, there's another element here. Uh, ideally, uh, we we would heartily reckon re um, welcome another manufacturer. It, it'd be healthier to have more manufacturers in IndyCar. So probably mm -hmm. more manufacturers are interested in electrification. So we're all going, um, you know, for people who've driven hybrids, they're, they're pretty cool. I mean, you get tremendous mileage and fun to drive and all these mm -hmm. sort of things. So, so really, I think the hybrid is there for, um, you know, to try and, uh, A, be relevant to current where the world is and B, hopefully attract more, um, manufacturers who could be interested in electrification, that sort of stuff. You can see it sort of worked in LMDH. There's four manufacturers in LMDH. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, um, at least right. another one coming next year and maybe two. So yep. um, people yep. people want the electrification. They want the sustainability. So as far as I'm aware, um, you know, and it's a good place to show it, develop it, that sort of stuff. The uh, the technology I guess consists of what an MGU so a motor gener motor generator unit uh, that I believe is being fitted to the rear of the car and then an energy storage unit that's being placed by the the gearbox casing is that correct? So everything uh, everything is in the bell housing. So you got the engine and you got the gearbox. Oh, okay, okay. In the middle of it is the bell housing where the clutch and the input shaft of the gearbox lives. Um, so everything. It, it's really beautifully packaged. Everything is in the bell housing. So the motor is in there. The energy store is in there. Again, that's where racing is good. It shouldn't. It's pretty hard life for it in there. But the reason it's there is for safety. Um, we, ah. we race cars at 240 miles an hour. It's, you know, it's like the Reno Air Races. So uh, <laughs> so if there is a problem, mm -hmm. you, you really want to contain it. So a safe place to put it is in the bell housing, which is, you know, wow. a little, sort of a fortress. Um, it's one of the safest places we could think of when it was being discussed, um, you know, particularly racing on ovals, all that sort of stuff. Um, the, the cars themselves are immensely safe, but you want to make sure the bit behind the survival cell, you don't want bits um, getting loose or anything like that. So it's all put in the bell housing. So the motor is um, in line between the gearbox. The shaft that goes from the engine to the gearbox goes through the motor. So the motor's around that shaft. So that's pretty cool. And then above that, squeezed in, is uh, the energy store, which is actually super capacitors, so, um, wow. which are very high power. Not a huge amount of energy, but um, if you want like a push to pass thing, so can we use it for overtaking, that sort of stuff? Can we help it? Can it help the racing? IndyCar racing is pretty awesome. You, the nice thing about it, you don't know who's going to win. So uh, people yeah. are battling race long, like Scott Dixon comes from the back to the front. <laughs> so yeah. so, um, so can we use the hybrid um, ideally to help the show? I mean, people very conscious that we have some great fans and we need to entertain them. It's, it's a, mm. it's a sport. It's an entertainment. It's Honda. We do it to develop our people and the technology, but we're also conscious that it's a sport. It's an entertainment. It needs to be exciting to watch. Can the hybrid had a bit of that? Can it have more power with push to pass and things to help, help the overtaking even more? So there's already hmm. a ton of it in IndyCar, but, and then can you do some interesting things on ovals? Could it help there? Don't know. We're going to find out. For the, um, for the push to pass, like how, how will, 
I guess, uh, like, how is that now going to to work with the hybrids? And then also on top of that question, you know, how will the, I guess, the regenerating process of push to pass, how, how will that work as well? Good question. We got to figure all that out. So, um, so that's oh, okay. Been dis- okay. <laughs> that's, no, that's a good question. That's we're discussing that at the moment. What is the best way to do it? So right now we're actually due to various. Uh, COVID, like we're, we're helping with the hybrid system and Chevy and Ilmore, uh, helping with the hybrid system. So the first thing is get it working. So get it working, um, get, make sure, uh, super capacitor packs can work, motors can work. It's, it's a really, really arduous environment. It's sandwiched between the engine and the gearbox. It's been shaken to death. It's been made too hot. It's too small. Doesn't fit. <laughs> All the things racing is good at salt. That's what we do. That's the cool bit. So, um, so let's get it working in parallel. There are discussions on the best way to use it. So really it's, it's obviously up to IndyCar. Um, what they think they have a, an overview of the sport, what they think is best for the sport. And we just need to support them so that it's used. I have a personal opinion. I would like it seem to be used for, you know, Fun, fun to drive, um, overtaking, that sort of stuff. And try and show people what's mm-hmm. going on. Um, I'm conscious as an engineer, sometimes we do all this sort of stuff and it gets hidden away, mm-hmm. which is awesome. Yeah. You know, it's really good for the engineers and all that sort of stuff, but sometimes it's hidden away. So can we find a way to show people mm-hmm. what it's doing? And then can we find a way to... My personal opinion, we'll see what actually happens. And it could be it comes in steps, you know, one, get it working. And then once we understand, you can start to change it. The lovely thing about motors, battery controls, it's all software controls. So you can change things. So let's, let's find out what you've got to be careful for is unintended consequences. You don't want to say, right, this is what we're going to do. And it's set in stone. And then, ooh, that's not quite what we thought. It's, um, so, so we, Get it working, and then with IndyCar, with GM and stuff, we'll figure out what's the best way to use it to, uh, my opinion, help the show. I like the uh, I like how they have the 200 seconds of push to pass at the moment, and how yeah. drivers need to kind of manage manage that, and how do they use it? I mean, if you look at that last race, the the GMR Grand Prix, um, you know, obviously Scott Dixon you know, having the lead at the time and then Graham Rahal trying to chase him down. And at that, at that moment, I think like, I think like Scott had 69 seconds of push to pass, but Graham only had like 40 something because he had blown through so much of it during the race that, you know, Scott actually had an advantage because he took care of it and used it when he needed to. And so I, I like that aspect of the drivers having to really think about yeah. when, to, when and when not to, to use it. My, my opinion, that aspect of it. it's really... I could, couldn't agree more. My opinion with the hybrid, can we do something that's additive on top of that, where the driver is thinking about yeah. it, earning it, it's not automatic, it's not just a, mm. a, tra- a train where you use it. You, we see DRS trains and all that sort of stuff. We want, um, yeah. I mean, it has its, it, you know, has its purpose and stuff. And sometimes you see with the push to pass, it, sometimes it can be pushed to defend, you know, everyone's on it and stuff. We... Can we be, can we be smart and try and, I don't know, uh, like you say, see the, see the skill of the driver would will, will be my opinion, but let's see what's actually possible. We've got to figure it out because mm-hmm. there, there could be unintended consequences that we haven't thought about. Once we start playing with it, it's on track now. So once we start getting it uh, reliable and using it properly, we'll, we'll find out. There's some smart, the smart people inside IndyCar are in the group. So let's, let's use all the smart people. Will the, uh, I guess like some of the fans would, would worry about the sound being changed from the engines. I mean, no, the, not. does it change at all with this hybrid unit? No, no, still sounds IndyCar and, um, you know, the, you, you might hear, well, the engines still sound exactly like the engines, which is pretty cool. Again, it's a show. So I think that's important. The lovely thing is we're making yeah. all that noise on low carbon fuel. So we're, we're doing it responsibly, yeah. which is lovely. So I think yeah. there's a big, big place for that in racing going forward. Cause again, you got to entertain people, but let's be responsible because we, you know, we all want to look after the planet and all that sort of stuff. So 
but let's do it on low, let's make noise on low carbon fuel. So there's very little CO2 being emitted. And then hybrid and stuff. I mean, they do sound cool. I, I don't know if you've heard the LMDH cars when they do the EV launch. I have. I li- yeah, I like them a lot, actually. Yeah. So there's, yeah, I like, again, that, I like them a lot. That was an unintended consequence. We didn't think about that at the start, to be honest with you. So, and it sounds awesome. So, I think we should have a thing. It'd be nice to show the hybrid and some of that electrical stuff makes some pretty cool and weird noises. But can we combine it with the visceral feel of a 12,000 RPM screaming race engine as well? That'd be quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that would be my night. That, that was going to, I only got it for a few more minutes, but that was going to kind of be my next sort of question. You're know, like, is it possible to pair it with like a bigger engine, like a V8 or a V10? Like, is that, is that possible or would it actually be slower if you were to do that? Hey, well, I mean, we, we have the engines that we have now. I mean, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the, the nice thing about Indica, in my opinion, we have these 2.2 liter V6s and, running on a low carbon fuel, but making, you know, uh, 700 and something horsepower out of, um, again, just over a, a 2.2 liter engine. It's quite, it's quite impressive actually. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know the, the series is with, with V6s and stuff. The, uh, I have, um, I hear what you tell me about V8s and V10s, but, uh, I don't know. Maybe one day someone will think about that sort of stuff. I think the key thing is making sure you you use low carbon fuel. You do it responsibly. Low carbon fuel. And the yeah. I think there's probably a niche for that in the future. So we'll yeah, see. Well, I have you, a, you've seen like Sebastian. You've seen Sebastian Vettel running like some of his his older F1 cars, and he's been working with a company now running it on the the biofuels and stuff like that. And it yeah. looks like there could be an avenue for that maybe in the future, like you were saying. Let's see. Let's see. It depends where it goes. It's got to be, it's a mix, isn't it? You're trying to, racing should be trying to lead, show modern technologies, but it's also got to entertain. So you've got to find the right balance in yeah. there somewhere. The, um, the, the Lamborghini, uh, their LMDH uh, program, you guys worried about it? <laughs> well, we, you're very respectful of all your competitors. So, uh, at this level, everyone really knows what they're doing. So really cool. Thrilled that they're coming. It just adds to the spectacle. And then uh, we've got to make sure we're on our game. And I'm sure they'll be on their game. So, uh, yep, that's that's good, isn't it? It's good when you see a series growing, adding manufacturers. It's great for the fans. When we're here to entertain the fans, you see a Lamborghini LMDH car which looks like a Lamborghini thundering round and it's just great. And I have to say hats off to IMSA, ACO, FIA, LMDH, because those cars are pretty, they all sound a bit different. They all look a bit different. Racing's great. I'm a big fan of sports car racing. There's always something going on with the different classes. So yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm hooked. I'm I'm hooked. So yeah, I I agree. Uh, David, Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. That's president of Honda Performance Development, David Salters. David, thanks again. Thank you. And uh, thank you for everyone listening and all our amazing fans that uh, that follow our sport. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. And thank you to everyone out there. Really appreciate it.